Hi, how are you? I'm good. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming on. So I ask um, every one of my guests in the beginning of the show, what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? What does it mean to be Vietnamese? I'm proud to be Vietnamese. I was born in Vietnam and I'm a I'm Vietnamese American, but you know, my root is still, I'm still Vietnamese. So um, everything I do, the older I get, I want to do things, you know, to show people how proud I am of, you know, being a Vietnamese, you know, woman. Um, and there's a lot of success, successful people in the, um, you know, in the United States, everywhere, actually. Um, and I just want people to know that, you know, we've worked very hard and all the people that, you know, all the Vietnamese that work hard should get recognized. Why, why is that important, specifically to you, that we get recognized? Why is it to be recognized? I think it's only fair. Like, you know, people work hard to be recognized. Um, you know, um, I'm not saying that people have to thank them or anything, but I'm saying that, you know, in this world, there's people have, that don't do anything. And then of course there's people who are out there every day, you know, doing their job to make the world better, you know, to help others. And I think it should be recognized. And, you know, like I said, Vietnam, there are so many of Vietnamese people out there, are, you know, the successful one are very quiet about it. Um, and I think that goes for anyone. Usually the one that, you know, they, they know what they're good at, they're successful, they don't need to be, to tell anyone. But I think that, you know, a lot of people, you know, if they do something good, they should be, you know, recognized, you know, and, um, yeah, and, and perhaps, you know, th those that get recognized can help other people and teach them, you know, new things that and what they know and share it, and share it, you right. know, share their, um, you know, knowledge, you know, to other people. That makes sense. What was your journey from Vietnam to the United States? My journey, I was very young. Uh, I... I was born in Vietnam, in Saigon, but my family, um, we have, you know, family in Europe. So we, you know, my mom has a lot of business in, um, outside of Vietnam. And so my parents travel quite a bit when I was younger. I'm the youngest of six. So uh, I was the lucky one that gets to travel a lot because I was so young. My parents didn't want to leave me in Vietnam. So I you know, spent a lot of time abroad, uh, spent a lot of time in Paris, you know, on and off there, live on and off there for quite a while. And then when the fall, uh, I left Vietnam in 74. So I was blessed. I left first with my sister. And then, um, of course, my parents, you know, and my brothers uh, came afterwards. We were one of the luckier one that didn't have to, you know, running to the airport and doing all of that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, it so, was a good journey. I mean, like I said, we were like, you know, one of the first that came to United States. And of course it's like, everything is so new to us. You yeah. know, we, we basically had to do everything and, you know, yeah, to ourselves, our find our ways and everything. Um, but, we never worried about that. So you left Vietnam in 1974, you said, to go to yeah, Paris? Well, we actually before that, and then basically came to the United States, you know, um, 74. Wow. So it's like way before the fall. Yeah, way before the yeah. fall. So when, and you, then, when you arrived, where, what state were, were you guys located in? Oh, we came right to California. Oh, okay. And then so you yeah. spent your early years uh, in Orange County? San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. Why San Francisco? Yeah. My parents took me to uh, United States for the first time. I was about four, 
years old, four or five years old. First time in San Francisco, we traveled, you know, to San Francisco, um, you know, Florida, New York, everywhere. But the minute my parents set foot to San Francisco, I remember there's a picture of me as a little girl with my parents, like right by Golden Gate Bridge. We have a beautiful picture of three of us there. My parents said, if we, if, you know, if we have to choose a place to be our next home, for some reason, I think they knew that it was going to happen. Hmm. Um, San Francisco would be our home. They fell in love with it. What, what was it like growing up in San Francisco in the early years? Oh my God, I love it. I, I'm still, you know, I'm still live in the Bay Area. Um, but I went to, you know, um, high school, junior high, high school and college in San Francisco. Oh. I spent my whole life there. I'm a local and my stomping ground, you know, and I, I was like very adventurous since I was little, you know, since I was younger. So I know every little you know, side streets and, you know, I adventure out. I was, when I was younger, I was kind of a tomboy. So I was just kind of like adventure out and just check out everything. Very independent since I was a kid. Um, and I love every bit of it. And even today I live outside of um, the city, but I love, you know, this, like every time I go to the city, I love it. Just uh, to me, it's one of the most beautiful city in the world. It it sounds like your parents were very um, advanced. They kind of understood sort of to let you experience the the city. I mean, you you sound like they. It sounds like they gave you a lot of freedom. Is that right? Yes, my parents. My let's see how, how I say this. My parents are very old school, very traditional. You know, they taught all of us very well. You know, um, from manners to how to, you know, work for a living. You know, we, we our family is very, you know, well to do and very established in Vietnam, but nothing was given to us. Our parents, like, you know, pretty much like taught us all, like, you know, to do things for yourself. Um, and we, all of us are very grateful for that. And, but they are also modern, you know, they um, old fashioned in certain ways about, you know, like certain things, but then like when it comes to like dating or open-minded, they, they are very, mm. very avant-garde for, you know, that for, you know, during that time. I think because like my family, you know, they travel abroad a lot yeah. and, and yeah, we spend a lot of time in Europe and, you know, like their way of thinking is a little bit different. Thank God <laughs> I wasn't into the arranged marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they great. They are very great. And I, I think they very, they, they raise great kids, like all my, my, my brother and sister. So they, um, they were never worried about us. You know, they're very confident and they, they, they trust each one of us very much. So were, were there that's, a lot of Vietnamese people at that time growing up in San Francisco? Oh yes. I, it's funny. Um, during my like adult years, you know, like life in college and after college, I, I did not have a lot of Vietnamese friends, Asians, but not Vietnamese friends. Um, but during high school, I hung out with, you know, a whole group of Vietnamese friends. I was very involved in school. You know, we, ha we started a Vietnamese club, you know, this boy back then, you know, yeah. and, um, I, I was, um, I love sports. So I was very athletic. I play tennis, I play volleyball and, you know, I ski, I do all of that. And I'm kind of like one of those girl who's like I was a tomboy back then and basically um most of my friends were boys I get along really well with you know with male for some reason but like two three very good girlfriends you right. know but it was like a whole community of Vietnamese friends um and I still I'm in touch with 
a few of them still till today. Yeah. Yeah. What was the community like in the Bay Area in the early days? Um, was it most in San Francisco or is it in San Jose? It's funny, but because I grew up in San Francisco, I would just pre pretty much like everything San Francisco. I, I, I didn't spend much time at all in San Jose. I knew it was there, but I mean, you know, San Francisco was just my turf. I mean, I do everything in San Francisco. Now, well, when I turn 21, when I start going out and then couple my girlfriend who lives in, um, you know, the peninsula area, which is south of San Francisco, you know, I come down and go hang out with them. We go out and then we start going out like more, you know, then we, you know, we drive. So basically we go down to San Jose, go, you know, go to uh, wanna, you know, just kind of around the Bay Area. Right. But most of the time, I, I love San Francisco. I'm a pretty much a city girl, right? you right. know, it's my scene. And um, my parents at one point, they moved down to Southern uh, California and then uh, for business. And then when, when they moved back, they didn't move back to San Francisco. They moved to San Jose. Right. They were in, yeah, so they were in San Jose. So then I spent a little bit more time, you know, because I come and visit and spend time with them. I, I, I don't know if this is correct, but sometimes I think of um, San Jose sort of like Orange County. There's so much Vietnamese in Orange County and San Jose. And San Francisco is sort of like LA. They're like both like an hour hourish away. And San Francisco has like less Vietnamese. LA almost has no Vietnamese. It just, you know, probably pockets in Alhambra or San Gabriel. But it's for the most part, like in LA, LA, there's very few. Viet is it the same? You know, it's really funny. San Jose is kind of like Orange County. Um, I think Orange County is the largest, San Jose is second, and Houston is like the third. Right. You know, for the Vietnamese community. San Jose, I mean, it's all over. I mean, the Vietnamese took over pretty much. You know that, right? Yes. It was more Hispanic back then. And then San eventually it's like, it's just Vietnamese. Um, San Francisco is, you're right about having more people in, in San Jose. San Francisco is very old school, old money, you know, city. And if you, it's really much, it's much harder to get into the society of San Francisco. And, but once you're in, you're in. So basically me growing up there, do, doing what I do, you know, with business. And like, like you said, there is, there's not many Vietnamese people in San Francisco. Okay. It is, I think it's just because they started in San Jose and everybody gravitate to just go there because everything's there for them. Right. They made it into a whole community. San Francisco is opposite. It's just much smaller. And the people are, you know, um, that are in San Francisco, how do I say, it's more Americanized. Yeah. Not big prejudice, but the the, the, Sam, the Vietnamese that grew up in San Francisco is totally different than the Vietnamese that grew up in San Jose. And I'm also saying this, being very honest, the people that live in San Jose, some, sometimes they don't want to get out of that whole, like, you know, Vietnamese community. Um, it's not a bad thing. So many successful people down there, but they kind of stuck in that area and they don't get into like, they don't cross over. So basically, you know, now and then they wanted to do certain thing. They, they in the United States, but they can't cross over because um, they don't give themselves a chance. Where San Francisco people, the one that grew up in San Francisco, I grew up in San Francisco. I when I first started out, I have a lot of Vietnamese friends, but eventually was, we went to college and stuff and we went out to work. I kind of evolved and, you know, spend more time with everyone else. Every other race and everything was basically a good mixture. I mean, I, I think my knowledge and, you know, I learn a lot more because I, I opened my mind and I'm more open. Um, I speak Vietnamese fluently, you know that, but yeah. I also speak English. A lot of my friends still today who, you know, like live in San Francisco, basically 
lived there forever, you know, forever, but they they don't speak English. They just, just keep totally speak Vietnamese. And I say, if you want to learn, if you want to cross over to the other community, the other side for business, you need to blend yourself in, you know? So there's time and place for you to do, you know, just have fun and speak Vietnamese, but there's time and place that you need to do business. You know, that's my opinion. Yeah. You know, like, it's a hard thing sometimes um, because our community is so tight in Orange County and San Jose that it's a it's mm-hmm. a very comfortable place to be and you don't have to force yourself to 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 deal with uh, the outside culture. Oh yeah, of course. But the thing is, a lot of uh, like I said, I'm being very honest, and I'm going to tell you right now. From I have a lot of business that I own, you know, um, I do, you know, I, I think, you know, I do jewelry, I have an entertainment company, I have a consulting company, I have a product, you know, um, design company. So basically, a lot of people come to me because I think I'm one of the very few that kind of break into, you know, like the other side and successful at it. They asked me and I, you know, I said, yes, I can help you. But the thing is for me to help them, they have to help themselves. Right. You know, they wonder, like, how I said, this is how you need to blend in, you know, because like a lot of Americans love the whole Asian community and they try to blend in to the other side to do business. Well, if the Vietnamese want to, you know, kind of break over to kind of go to the other side, they need to do that, too. So um, I they want me to help, but they have to help themselves, you know, by doing the right thing. I I have obviously a series of questions that I've prepared, but can we make a a quick right turn? I just want to ask you about something Mm -hmm. that sort of I've been wondering about. I don't know much about it, but the, um, and if you don't feel comfortable bring talking about this, just let me know. But Mm -hmm. why is there so much um, sort of hate crimes that are going on in the Asian community in the Bay area versus all the anywhere else in the country? Um, it seems to be like just happening a lot to Asian people in the Bay Area. You know, this is really funny, but you asked me that. It, it, it hurts my heart when I hear about all of this. And I am not sure, to tell you the truth, it's everywhere. And I believe that it's been going on for years, okay? But people just don't talk about it until recently. And you know that this whole thing started last year when the Black Lives, you know, matter kind of thing. Now it rolled over to the Asian, right? To the Asian community, which is really sad. And even with the African-American, any nationality, there is always, to me, like that prejudice things going on, right? I mean, we live in the United States and you know there's so many places that you don't want to go there because the whole prejudice thing going on, right? But to me, that whole prejudice thing is jealousy. Mm. Because people that come into this country work and you know there are more foreigners in this country now than ever i mean you have well for you know chinese been here forever vietnamese you have you know indian from india you know i mean you look at all the most successful people there's so many people that are just like non-american you know not non-american born right or whatever so i think it's always there but it just kind of come out now, which is like, I'm glad it come out because then people can do something about it, right? Um, it is really sad and it's just kind of sad that it happened to elderly because they're the one that cannot protect themselves, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really upsetting. Um, um, it's also, you know, like someone, you know, your own size kind of thing, right? Yeah. If you're gonna yeah. pick, because they would dare to pick on somebody that can fight back, right? So that's the thing that's just, really drives me crazy to see that but um we 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 have to fight for it that's all i'm saying you know i mean but it's going to be tough because there are a lot of those people out there and and you know um 
a lot of those people, I, I think it's jealousy and non-educated and they are just, you know, upset that somebody's, you know, not a national is more successful than they are. You know, we, we, a lot of people say we come and take their jobs. A lot of people say about the Hispanics, the same thing. We're not doing any of that. It's the job will go to whoever will work hard and willing to work hard. And I think that's how this whole thing got started. Yeah. 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 I, to I, me, I've always just wondered in the last year, why is it so many in the Bay Area? But then I think about like, there's just such a big Asian population in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and there's your, there's some component to jealousy because maybe all of the people, the Asian people are perceived to be doing very well um, in the Bay Area. Yes. Yes. But I don't know. When you see, yeah. I say, in, Indian from India, you see the whole Silicon Valley, everybody moves in this whole area is from India. Yeah. But there's a reason. They're smart. They, They're smart, they yeah. work. It just, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? It, it's help us build the economy. I mean, they're not doing anything wrong. You know, you, you know, just have to, well, that's all. Yeah. But it, it is very upsetting. I mean, I'm telling you right now, it is not just the Asian. It's all over everywhere. It's been going for years. I mean, I, I have to deal with it, you know, now and then. But, you know, what you do is I just don't tell people doesn't mean that I don't have to deal with it. Right, right. What did uh, you know? What What did you study in in college? What did you want to become when you were coming up? Oh my goodness, that's so funny. It was one of those things where um, when it was time to go to you know college, I wanted to go to the East. Coast. I want to go away for college. You know, spend the really like you know college year. Yeah. You know, kind of like go away. Have an experience. But then I, oh, um, my sister didn't either. We both stay in you know uh, the bay area we both went to san francisco state and basically um the reason we did that because we wanted to stay and you know take care of family you know my mom and dad you know kind of like everything's new to them and we wanted you know we want to be nobody told us it just it was just us we just very close-knit family you know my sister and i we're the two youngest one but pretty much like we're like you know basically like the base of our family so we decide okay we're gonna stay you know in bay area and um you know let's just get this over with it was really funny because at that point i'm like okay now i have to go to college but i'm not gonna do what i want to do i just have to just get over with you know so i did you know, I, I study and I did a really quick, you know, like job just finished school. And of course, like, what do you do when you're not sure of what you want to do? You study business, right? You can always do something with it, right? right. right? Um, marketing, you know, basically. And, you know, <laughs> it's funny. It's like, I, I wasn't, you know, I was studying, I was working. I always work. I worked when I was 16 years old, you know, just a job. I cannot let my, the rest of my family work without me working. So I was doing, you know, working something, even in high school, I had a job at AAA, you know, it's like one of the three kids in the whole school that, you know, get giving a job, you know, at AAA, you know, it's, it's a, they, they chose certain students. So we, I was one of those. And then I just kind of work. And I, I love, I always love um, fashion. And of course, my mom's a jeweler. It's my grandpa, so I'm third generation. So I knew eventually I wanted to do that. So I took, you know, classes, gem- you know, gemology classes. And I took um, fashion class. I even went to the Fashion Institute mm-hmm. at one point. So, you know, and then of course, you know, graduated and then, all my, you know, I had a large group of friends and one of my graduates go, okay, what do I want to do? I went into investment banking. So it's really funny because everybody's like, yeah, we're going to, you know, this is what we're doing. I said, okay, I'll apply. So I went to Bear Stearns, I applied and I got a job at Bear Stearns. So, <laughs> so I can't, <laughs> it, it's just very random, you know, and if you know what I do now, you will know why I did it. I'm one of those, like, if I like something, I'm a really quick learner. I will just, 
you know, do it. So basically I went to Bear Stearns, I applied and I worked for the Muni Bonds Department under six, yeah, six brokers. I was like the sales assistant, you know, get foot in the door. And, you know, during that period, it's the late 80s. That is a men's world. So, yeah. And so it was super fun, though. It was like very interesting um, to work in that whole, you know, investment banking. And it's like, it it was crazy to see like that kind of money going around, you know, like, right? Heck yeah. (laughs) 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 This is like, I was, I told you, I was like, work hard play hard yes I your am. eyes lit up your face lit up when i'm like there's I a know. lot of partying it was a lot of partying but it was great i built that's when i started building my rolodex and even there i was jewelry has always been my love right and and i always love i i love fashion so i'm always dressed to tea you know so um, so basically, I, I'm wondering, like, you know, what's going on? And so basically, I every day is like work hard, one o'clock market close, and you just go out. You know, we entertain clients, and we have all my girlfriends. I was the one that makes the most money, very successful at it, really fast. Within uh, the year, I basically got chosen from the uh, senior managing director, I went up to work for institutional trading and I took my series seven as well. Wow. So it happened really fast. So I worked with uh, you know, institutional trading. I mean, it was insane because we were given, you know, like credit card, you know, just like, okay, it's over. Clients come into town. You guys take them to dinner. And then it's funny. It's like, friends meeting afterwards it's it, it's that wall street craziness Free for all yeah yeah so and and i i mean it came to a point where like i was the one who take care of i treat my girlfriends i go on big trips because you know my bonus check i mean it's just like i was making money at a very early age it's something that i wasn't even planned to do so it was really you know it was really fun but then I basically met my husband <laughs> and then the time, and then we pretty much, we got married and we want our kids right away. And I, you know, he, he lives, he's from uh, the peninsula. He's from Los Altos area. So we wanted to, you know, um, raise kids. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to commute, go to San Francisco every day. So I took a job with a, uh, south of San Francisco and San Mateo area uh, with Franklin Templeton. I went back to Muni Bonds because I that's where I started. Right, right. And worked there with some of the most amazing, well, Bershon was great, but some of the most amazing people that I'm still friends with till today. Um, and uh, I worked there for six years before I actually start my own business. How, how long were you at Bear Stearns for? Bear Stearns about good five years five almost six years so, the 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 you you brought up wall street i i'd imagine that the guys at bear stearns had the same tempo and the same beat like it, that quick pace of partying and stuff but mm-hmm. at the same time you were a vietnamese woman in your probably in your 20s at the time right did you mm-hmm. experience sort of it sounds like you experienced sort of a sort of equality because i don't hear the the inequality in your your voice, you 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 remember it as a really good time. That is a uh, very refreshing to me to hear, right? Um, that you that you actually got a lot of. It sounds like you got a lot of respect from the the boys that you were working with. It's really funny. Uh, like I told you before, right? I um, I get along with like male yeah. very well. Like I said, I was in my early twenties when I was there, right? So of course, like. <laughs> I'm not I don't have a big head trust me but <laughs> ask, go ask out by you know a lot of people and I'm like I'm like the fun party girl yeah. right but in a good way you know work hard play hard but at the same time 
for some reason they guys just like even those guys they just don't mess around with me respect so yeah so um it sounds like a, a very equal even playing field for you um in that environment it is. I think no matter of like by that time I'm always like you know I'm like totally love wearing dresses and all, I was no longer the tomboy but I think it still show like don't mess around with me kind right. of thing so nobody mess around with me so I I you know I I mean of course now and then a few of them try but <laughs> but I put them in their place so but- it's and uh, yeah it, it's pretty funny but then like I said I'm always like that person with a business mind they they knew I was there and they also know that I have my jewelry background this is really funny so but all my jewelry so everybody knows my mom at the time had a store and I even back then I helped her behind the scene with designs and I worked you know like just a little bit into the jewelry thing so it's funny but everybody at you know, Bear Stearns, a lot of them, like when it's time to go to look for an engagement ring and mm-hmm. stuff, I yeah. I start doing like rings and helping them through my mom's business. Wow. So so that's why I, I even did that at Franklin. And my boss at the time, who's still one of my like very close friends till today, but he's a very successful man. And, um, you know, <laughs> They, he's the one who kind of pushed me to start my jewelry business when he went to New York for another position, you know, and I basically just like he say it's time. So he's like, go start your business, own business. That's when I I started. And when, when you went to start your own business, um, this was to produce jewelry. I started like a jewelry line under my name and and can you tell me about that how did that uh become what what exactly what kind of jewelry did you produce and for what market so it was 2002 yeah it was 2000 i decided you know my mom always wanted me to you know take over the business you know she has a storefront i didn't want to do that I'm, I love what my mom do. She's so very creative and she's just amazing at what she, you know, did. But I said, I want to take it to another level. And I'm like in a different, you know, basically, you know, period, time period, right? So instead of like having a, I didn't want to get stuck in a store. I said, you know what? I'm going to create like jewelry, like my own jewelry line. And I'm going to let somebody else sell it you know, and built my name. Um, I'm very determined once you know me, it's like once I want something, I'll make it happen. So I said, my favorite store is Neiman Marcus. So I'm going to tell, I'm going to make the jewelry line. I'm going to walk into the store. I'm going to tell them to sell it. Everybody kind of looked at me like, "Uh uh-huh. Like basically like my husband, my husband's the only one that like totally believe in me. He's looked at me, he goes, I know you're going to do that. It's going to happen, right? It's right. like, basically, he, my husband's very supportive of everything, he, you know, that I do. So I did. I called my mom up and I, I, um, I said, mom, let's, let's sit down and talk and let's do a trip. I know you're manufacturing and I work with them, you know, over the year with you, but now I want to create my own line. My mom was amazing. She's, she didn't even, you know, I mean, like more. Mm-hmm. She didn't get mad, like, because I didn't want to take over. So she's like, she, but, but she knew that I was going to go into the, you know, jewelry direction, which is follow footsteps. She was just thrilled. So we, we created, you know, a line. She just basically, I, you know, I designed a line. She looked at it and she's like, yeah, it's like, you know, you, this is amazing. So it's really funny how you grow up around someone. You don't realize how much you watch them and, and, you kind of basically your focus is everything you see is it's you know kind of like a sponge it's just you absorb everything yeah I create mine I love color stone and that's like exactly what my mom does she's a diamond person but color stones and at the, the time um United States they were not like very open-minded everything is like diamond and small you know kind of like 
things, not into a big things. I grew up in Europe. Everything is more lavish. It's more old school. It's beautiful. It's colorful. So I said, you know what? I'm going to be different. And this, that's the other thing that you should know. I don't follow trend. I create a trend. And that's what I like. I created new things. And to me, I mean, I still follow, you know, what's in, whatever, but I, I use that. And I, you know, for example, green is the next year color. I, I follow green, but I do something that's on my own. Right. You know, not, not like, like every design, I have things the same. So I, you know, I just took the chance. I created like very like classic yet mixed with modern uh, jewelry line. And yes, I did walk into Neiman Marcus and I did, I didn't even go to the buying office. Um, my nickname at Neiman Marcus is the backdoor lady because <laughs> I did that. I walk into the store, talk to my favorite personal shopper and I say, look, I have a jewelry line now and I want to talk to the manager of the jewelry department and see what he thinks, right? And it's funny, I didn't choose San Francisco either because San Francisco is really conservative. So I, I chose the market that I think is more open-minded. So I went to Las Vegas. Right. I went to Makes Las sense. Vegas, Neiman Marcus. I showed the manager at the time, Patrick, my line. He just went nuts. He's like, oh, you know, th- you got to stand some of these, people are like they know jewelry but they just kind of like work at certain place they have to sell certain thing and they don't have the merchandise they want but it's just because you know there's nothing out there right so basically he saw that and he's like oh my god this is really this is what you call jewelry and i believe that i have the talent that my mom you know came from my mom but I also believe in faith and in luck. It's timing. So it just happened when I was there, when I met Patrick, the assistant buyer from corporate was there. Oh, wow. And that's everything. Because I had to go try to get an appointment to go to like to meet the buyers at Neiman Marcus. You know, that's what they want to say. So no it's way. like, who are you? What, you know, you don't have a brand. You don't have anything. It is not easy. So can, can I, I you, can I ask you this? Yep, like, did you put together like a, like a package? Did you put together like a line and branded it and yep. went through the, cause like when I think about Neiman Marcus or anything corporate, I think like you have to go through specific channels, right? And you, you, you. Bring- exactly. That's exactly what you have to do. I did have a package. I had a, I had a collection, you know, you have to create a collection right you know, have a brand, but I don't have a name, right? But I went to them and Patrick liked it. The system by its time, she went out and she goes, this is incredible. And that's one thing about me, the relationship I built with everyone that I know, people, I I sort of gravitate toward me and, you know, they, I don't say anything I don't mean. So basically I say, you know what? why don't we, you know, give it a try? I know that I don't have a brand yet, but I have the merchandise. I'm willing to, you know, work with the store and market the heck out of it, you know? And both of them, the assistant by Ann Patrick, they were both like, let's call Larry, which is the head buyer for New Yorkers forever. You know, um, he still is today. Let's call Larry, you know, at the office. They call Larry. And assistant buyer told him that this is, you know, this client, but then now she started to create a line and it's incredible. And both, you know, Patrick and I think that we should do a trunk show for her. So Larry's like, okay, done. I was like, oh my God, wow. right? Wow. So we planned a trunk show for like, I think like a month and a half or two months later. So we scheduled a date. I came back, you know, for the trunk show. Can you tell me yeah, what, a trunk, what a trunk show is? Trunk show is when you bring in a new brand or you have like a brand, but then you have a new collection that you want to show. It's called a trunk show. Like and you have, like, 
any designer, you know, even clothing. Is that one store or for the entire corporate for Neiman Marcus? No, don't show, you can schedule for each store. Like for example, um, Dolce Gabbana, right? They have like a new collection for spring. And they, so they show that in the fall and they want it, you know, you know they, what they do is they schedule a time. Sometimes they do appearance of the designer or, you know, that kind of thing. Invite a client in to see the new collection. It's called Trunk Show. Mm, got it. So, you know, you can, you can pre-purchase, pre-order things, you know, from, well, yeah. So that's what they did. And then they, um, and so they schedule it and I came in that week that was that is like two days trunk show usually like they do one or two days i came into vegas after the first trunk show which is like the two days we sold like eighty thousand dollars wow 80 no brand they just and the thing is you got to get the right customer and neiman marcus has that customer right. customer who travel around the world buy the best things that you know you can't find in the United States and now they they found my jewelry who's you know they've never seen ever in the United States and now you know that they would go to go to Europe to buy it now they're here they love it and from that success you know today of the trunk show they um Patrick called the Newport Beach the fashion island in Newport mm. Beach Store and uh, Christopher was the ma uh, the manager at the time. We basically did a trunk show in Newport. After there, again we sold. So after Newport Beach was, we went to Bow Harbor, which is another amazing store, mm -hmm. you know, in Florida. And that was like that was it. I I became um, a vendor. They took me in the mat. I didn't even meet Larry, which is the, you know, the buyer till a year later when we went to the couture um, jewelry show in Vegas the following year. I mean, it was funny. And even when I met him, I, I say, how do you want to work this? He just gave me like, you know, carte blanche. It's like, do you are successful with what you're doing. Put in whatever jewelry you want. Pick how many store. I was in. 33 stores wow like literally like just place it how, how long did it take from from that first uh encounter in vegas to being in 30 stores two years really wow. fast that's fast it was super fast it was like instant success what, and Neiman Mark built my name what was the name of the brand jewelry by rosalina Simple as that. It's funny because I told a really good friend of family when I did this. It's like, I, what do you want to call it? I said, Jury by Rosalina. She's like, well, why, why are you using your name? I say, well, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's easy to remember. So Jury by Rosalina became a thing. And actually, the third year I was at Neiman, they switched manager, Patrick is no longer there. And Robert became, uh, it's a new manager there. And it was funny, it was during the, the jewelry show in Las Vegas that I usually host, you know, all of the manager um, during, you know, the jewelry show um, to thank them and you know, also to meet them to show new, you know, line and everything. And Larry said to me, at dinner, he's like, you got to meet Robert. You guys are going to work well together. Well, he wasn't kidding. Robert came in that June to, you know, to the store that fall, which is six months later. We, he, he scheduled me, he scheduled a personal appearance for me at the store right before the holidays, like beginning of December. I went in there and unbelievable I sold over close to a million dollars just two days. And that year, which is Robert's first year at Neiman Marcus, he was manager of the year because. Um, Your parents are probably like super excited, right? Your mom is like really proud and things are going great, right? 
and oh yeah no, it was it was it was crazy right. it's like you know of course they didn't have any doubt you know that I was gonna make something out of it but it was beyond what I thought I was gonna do as well um yeah it was very 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 cool but it, it, it's like all of the knowledge that you had from Bear Stearns, from Templeton, all of these previous sort of like hustles it probably really made you understand sort of like there's a, a certain way to communicate within a community, a corporate community, or, you know, taking your mom's uh, experience and knowledge and then melding it, uh, bringing it together uh, with the uh, banking sort of like environment and bringing it all together probably really allowed you to, to, to take off really fast, it sounds. You know, what's funny is I'm really happy that I did investment first. It taught me how mm -hmm. to like manage the business. You know, that was, that was, that was in my head when I did it. I said, you know what? I want jewelry, but I say it's not right yet, right out of college. So basically I want to learn how to manage my business. So I, I think that was a great choice. And still till today, it helps in everything I do. Do you, you I mean, I person who you know I have people do things and actually my husband you know at one point uh, of the jewelry business he he sort of retired because we had kids right away but I yanked him back in and he agreed to do it he's my CFO for all my company pretty much he met he he's that side of it right. he let me to the, the creative okay. side you know of the business that's the best uh, setup when you have somebody controlling your money mm -hmm. that you trust. What um, yeah. are, are, is the jewelry line still in operation today? Oh yeah. It will never stop. <laughs> it will so never stop. What, what other stores and um, what other brand uh, stores are you in now? Well, see, here's the thing. When you go like to the best store, you gotta like, where else are you going? We went into Burkdorf at one point as well. Um, but Burkdorf is a whole different breed. They own by, you know, same company that own Thiemann. But it's like, that's when you have to hire your own, you know, um, salesperson, New York. I mean, it's it's a whole- Different game. Politics of that. And then I started to sell a lot to boutiques, you know, mm -hmm. but my jewelry, it's not a mass produced jewelry. I always wanted to be very exclusive and people who wear my jewelry, you will recognize it right away. I do a lot of custom pieces. So we have boutiques, you know, from LA to Miami to, New, you know, just carrying the jewelry. But then I started to do like a lot of referrals. So our business is based on like the major referral clientele. I design very exclusive pieces for clients. So um, I still do that today. I have clients, not just United States, all over the world. Um, so it's a, our own operations. And in a way, I kind of like that better than having to deal with, you know, stores. I mean, I still deal with certain stores. If, you know, I'm, I'm, I like them or we work well together, you know, um, but it's my own business pretty much. But then about two, a year before COVID, I was asked to start a new line. It's basically, it's, it's like a high-end costume jewelry. And it's pretty much for clients who travel a lot, but they, instead of just wearing like, custom jewelry they want to wear the kind of jewelry that they love right but they don't have to worry about insurance so I created a line similar to what I you know do but it's using you know man-made stones instead right, right? right. so I, I start doing that and then four seasons start carrying it it's great place for like you know four season hotels you know luxury hotel and when people travel, they forget things as well, you know, and yeah. so, and it's a good price point. You don't pay it. like price point was around like 300 to about the, high, the highest price piece is like 4,500. 
you know, which for the clientele for season, that's like Nothing. no problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you still have the great look of fine jewelry. So I can imagine doing all of these referral clients and working all over the world, you're probably meeting a lot of different people in different industries and probably getting offered to do different businesses, right? Like dabbling. Oh, in I, get, I get that's how come I have my role of sex. That's how come when we get into further on this conversation, that's how come I do so many things and so many different, you know, um, business, you know, field because right. Jewelry, people just buy jewelry, you know, everybody buy jewelry. I mean, at one point in my life, I when I one time I was in Vietnam for business. I, I was in Vietnam for um what do you call it? The uh, uh, Miss Universe. Remember the first yes. Miss Universe one? I actually I designed a crown for for oh, wow. the pageant. And uh I was there for business and I got this phone call. It was like crazy enough, it was Sergey Brin. <laughs> you know who Sergey Brin is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what, what what was the call about? He was married to his wife back then. He called me to design a piece of jewelry. And it's funny because my one of my very good friends managed Sergey and, and both Sergey Brin and Larry Page. And of course, you know, he he told Sergey because he's looking for certain juries like you need to call Rosalina. I got a call from Sergey. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. okay, so and I told, and it is so freaking random, but it was really funny because and I get that all the time, and I'm like I'm not surprised anymore. I get like call from like you know random like celebrities and things like that, but it's it's just fun, you know, it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, so I told, uh, he's like, Rosalina, are you in town? I said, and I live in the same area where right. Sergey lives, right? And he's like, I want to see some jewelry. And I go, I said, Sergey, I would love to show you jewelry and I would love to design stuff for you, but I'm in Vietnam right now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that's like something like that. You know, I mean, you meet like everybody. And I mean, and then one time I was in Miami. That's right. I was in a, I was in my room getting ready for the Grammys because I was there for the Grammys. We did we do like a lot of th uh, yeah. my jewelry. We do a lot of marketing, and I chose you know like so for movies and celebrity to do my marketing you know for jewelry. So that's how come now we're gonna veer to you know toward the right. film industry. So I deal a lot directly with celebrities, and so. I, I went to the Grammys. I did like a gifting suite. Right. This is when gifting suite got big, right? So I was there and I was ready to go out to a night event. I was in my room. I remember exactly. It's funny. My sister was there, like a like couple of the girls worked for me. We were in a room and I was getting ready. And I also, my phone rang, right? And Eva, she picked up the phone, my assistant. Um, she picked up the phone and then, you know, she's like, Rosalina, it's for you. I say, Eva, I'm trying to get ready to get out of here. She's like, I think you should take the call. Mm -hmm. And I said, who is it? She's like, it's Orlando Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh, it was so funny. And it's random. And it's funny because I had just met him at the premiere of Superman Return, which is came out way back then. And I did the jury for Parker Posey in the movie. I did all the jury. And he was dating Kate Bosworth at the time. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Kate yes. was in the movie, she was Lane. And so I met him there. And then, of course, you know, we were introduced. And, you know, he said, Well, you know, do you make, you make jewelry? What can you do? I didn't say anything, you know? And so I said, Just call me. Well, he did. He called me and I talked to him. And he was doing Pirates of the Caribbean at the time. So I created, um, he's old school British, right? He, he wanted tie tags, you know, for his tie. I created one for him. So, yeah, so it's it's fun. It's I love my job. I, seriously, I always, all of my jobs from jewelry, you know, investment banking was fun. My party years, right? I still party today, by the way. <laughs> haven't stopped. <laughs> um, so I, 
went to the Hill Jewelry, met amazing people. Uh, Jewelry brought me to the celebrity world, but also to the socialite world. Um, my very good friend in San Francisco, she was my publicist at the time. She introduced me to like everyone, the whole society group in San Francisco. And that was a lot of fun to get to go to a lot of galas and, you know, fun luncheons and dress up and, you know, in gowns and it's just a fun world. My job, and I work all the time. It's, you know, you call it work, but fun work, work that, right. you know, you know, like boring work. So, you know, but then the celebrity world, I start doing a lot of that. And then I start meeting a lot of, um, you know, people in the film industry. And I always have the love for film. That was the other thing, you know. Um, so it wasn't hard at all. And it was in no time I start like just start doing a little bit of here, there, you know, and then I met a really good friend of my, a now really good friend who's a writer, director who worked like a lot for like 25 years, who worked with Disney. Um, so we decided to do a first short film. Uh, I think that was about five, four or five years ago. And that was my first um, executive produced, you know, a, you know, a film. And we enter it, you know, in a bunch of like film festivals. So it was really fun, but that's how I got into it. So this person from who worked at Disney for all these years, uh, you became friends with this person and he said, Hey, I have this idea for a short, right? And then he brought you on as an EP. But but what mm -hmm. exactly in your mind were you getting into? Like why would you I do it at that time? Get you know, it's really funny because I, I mean, I had a meeting with Matt who was introduced to me and we sat down and he asked me, he's like, what do you want to do? I said, you know what? I love the whole film industry. I, I told him, I think I love to produce, you know, basically. And he's, and I say, I said, how do you do it? And then he said, well, there's a lot of different way, you know, of doing it and the different roles and the whole you know, producing and, you know, the whole movie world. And then he said, let me think about that too. So basically, I mean, our, our first conversation we clicked right away, but then he put that whole producing thing even deeper in my head. And so again, I have a lot of friends in the industry. Another person that I met before I met Matt, she, her name is Lonnie. Lonnie Natter and her husband Gil produced, um, and he's a director. And she, um, do you remember the Blind Side? I do the football the, film, the Sandra Bullock, and yeah, the true yeah. story. That's one of my favorite movie, by the way. I love that movie. I love Sandra Bullock. She that's who, she did that. Her husband also did Life of Pi, which won an Oscar. I mean, they've done like a lot of things, right? She's a, she's an amazing woman, and we became really good friends. Again, it's through jewelry, by the way. Wow. wow. And then um, I came to her after I met Matt, and I said, Lonnie, I think that I'm going to, I want to get in your world. You know, like, how do I produce? How, you know, I talked to Matt. She looked right straight at me. She goes, Rosalina, you already a producer. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you, it's putting things together. And she's like, you are such, you know, a businesswoman. Look at all the things you've done through the years. You're already there. And then I was like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> so mean, basically. Just a matter of mathematics, right? It's numbers. Yeah. And finding mm -hmm. good um, things that you think that people are going to buy. Good stories that people are going to buy into, right? <laughs> And yeah. then connecting is like the probably the biggest thing as a producer. Exactly. And through the few, you know, the last few years, asking lots of questions from people that in the industry, Lonnie's is totally like, you know, I can call her anytime. She would do that for me. I'm, you know, Matt is that we're working with a lot of projects together. And there's another gentleman that I'm totally like amazed. 
and one of my, and of course he executive producer for one of my favorite movies, uh, Jeffrey Chernoff. Jeffrey Chernoff is one of the executive producer for Star Trek, Mission Impossible. I mean, like major, big, big you know, major. third, you know, I mean, he just one of those great guys. And it's funny, but I met Jeffrey through one of my friend, Libby, um, Gretchen, Gretchen Libby. Gretchen works for ILM, which is part of Lucasfilm in the Bay Area. Right. Again, it's my Bay Area peeps, right? And she's, again, through jewelry, she's one of, like, the person head of ILM, which is the special effects. So their company do a lot of special effects for a lot of, you know, movies and, you know, all the big stuff. And Gretchen goes to, of course, the Oscars a lot. And when she goes to the Oscars, she wanted me to deck her out with bling, right? right. <laughs> so we just, I mean, we just like friends and she introduced me to Jeffrey. She also introduced me to Chantal, uh, uh, which is the executive producer for uh, um, front, uh, what's the movie with the the uh, the hunt? Oh my God! Why am I blanking out? Uh, what's her name? The the one that um, Jennifer Lawrence. Um, the she games, did. Hunger Games. Hunger, Hunger Games. Yes, I mean I just met like a bunch of like amazing, amazing people just through friends and people all always like willing to help, willing to give me heads up because I wanted, you know, to do this. So yeah, so it's, you, it's really So you and Matt produce your first short, right? Yes. And it's then, called Bubble. Bubble. What Was it a live uh, animated? Oh no, it's live. Live. And how long was that short? Like, it's a good like 10, it's a eight, 10 minutes. You know, it's 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 really cool. I'll I'll send you a link. Okay. And what really what cool. did producing that first short do for your sort of your understanding of the process? Great learning curve, you know, because I was learning how to put things together and it makes me want to produce more. Now I want bigger. So <laughs> Yeah, it just doesn't stop. I mean, I love the whole industry. You know, I mean, growing up, um, I'm a movie buff. My mom and I, you know, I mean, just I watched everything you can imagine. Even when I first came to the United States, my Sundays with my mom's watching all the classic black and white. You know, my mom loves it because of the glamorous, obviously, you know, the right. whole, whole old school, you know, glamorous it's amazing back then you know the actresses the actors it's, it's totally different than now so learning is funny we watch it because of like the whole fashion jewelry and everything but then I got into it you know it's like the whole film industry it's like how to make films like how amazing is these people on the big screen you know and yeah. I just fell in love with it yeah and then, so from there, what other projects uh, did you start to get into? Um, it's funny, but I was thinking of doing a few things, right? And I got approached by a friend of mine's uh, boyfriend who was working with Lionsgate, um, and they were recruit this is right after crazy rich asians came out so they want to make a reality show i didn't even have time to think about anything i mean i got approached right to cast to help cast a family to do the the, the show and funny enough they they know them i'm from the bay area they say my gosh there's a lot of wealthy you know like Chinese. They didn't say the word like Vietnamese. I think they say Chinese in San Francisco. Rosalina, can you help but cast somebody? You know, and I said, sure. That sounds like fun, and I love the movie. By the way, I love mm -hmm. Crazy Rich Asians, and you know, Chancho, he's from my area right. originally, and so um, I kind of came home, think about it, think about who I know, 
you know, and all of that. And I said to myself, I go, oh my God, we have so many family that I know who are my clients. I said, but they're not going to do this because a lot of wealthy people don't want to open up their personal right. life, you know, stuff. Um, and then, but then I said, but then there are other families like, they don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> they're too boring. <laughs> so I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, like, you know, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And out of the blue, I woke up like this, like the third, fourth night after, you know, my phone call with, you know, Lionsgate and everything. Um, I thought about this guy that I know, that I've known him since he was 21 years old. I said, oh my God, he's crazy enough, like to make this show very interesting. You know, so I told my husband and my husband kind of looked at me and go, oh my God, you just call it. So I called him and he's not from the Bay Area. He's from Houston, right? Called him. I told him what, you know, what's happening. The phone went kind of quiet at first. And he's like, you kidding, right? It's like, well, you know, it's like, that sounds like really fun, <laughs> but. I do not know anything about the movie industry, you know, the TV, the entertainment industry or, you know, and I, I explained to him more, talk over the next few days. And he goes, I want to give this a shot. This sounds like really amazing. And he's, but he said, you have to talk to my family and my wife though, because they're not going to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to convince them and we, I put them, you know, I put him on a call with Peter Huntley, which is the casting director for, you know, for the show. And Peter was kind of like fell in love like instantly with them. It, it, it was almost like it was meant to be because he's like his character. He just had that thing about him that you know you can tell it's like he'll be perfect in front of a camera but it wasn't just that the whole history about you know like the family is basically the names itself the the parents name you know the children after american presidents yeah. that's a okay, who does story. That? yeah who does that yeah right so it was like again it was just meant to be so yeah so we we, we pretty much like you know, I, they, you know, they did the, the interview through, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, it was in Zoom. What was the other Skype. one? Um, Skype. Skype. There you go. Oh my God. Skype sounds like it's forever, you know, yeah. like, oh, right. Ago, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And it's like, they did a Skype thing and then they did a sizzle and they showed it to Lionsgate. It was like, we loved it. Sizzle? Uh, Peter did the sizzle. Okay, P Peter, so Peter flew a crew out to do the sizzle with the family. No, the sizzle was just chosen. You know, the, it was like they did like clips of things, video wow. that the family sent them. It wasn't even like, you know, Nothing. flying out was... there. Quick four or five minute sizzle so Lionsgate can see, you know, they loved it. And then after that, a lot of talk. And it was funny because the person who started this whole project was Jennifer O'Connell. She was the head of television division at Lionsgate and she loved it. And then it kind of moved forward, but through the whole negotiation, Jen, uh, Jen was, um, Jen got contact by Warner. They wanted to bring her over to Warner, you know, hired her to become, you know, to run the, this new streaming, which is now, you know, the HBO Max. And after like a few interviews, she decided to take the job, but she also decided like, I'm going to take this with me. Project, wow. Project, because she loved it. And, you know, they, then they hired a company and, you know, that would shoot the pilot. So they asked me to help with the pilot. So they you know, we, we flew to um, Houston. So I was there the week before 
kind of work with the family, you know, staging, you know, fix everything up, come up with the storyline. And basically, what are we going to film about for the, you know, for the pilot? pilot? And it just happened with timing. It was Washington and his wife, Leslie's birthday month. So the whole thing was based on, you know, like how they planned the birthday, how he surprised her with the birthday. They born like a week apart. And also one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure that production knows that I want to talk a lot about Vietnamese tradition. Not many people do that. You know, like there's all these shows that talk about, you know, like, fun, partying, da, 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 whatever. I say, yeah, let's talk about a little bit of tradition because, you know, the parents are involved as well. So, yes, yeah, so that's what we did. We, we filmed it by showing, you know, like the New Year's, the holidays, how we celebrate that, right? How we celebrate it, you know, like there's a lot of things I want to involve. So, but we did the, the, um, the birthday, you know, and like, the family, you know, gathering in the weekend, you know, kind of thing. So yeah. it's really interesting. How, how and of difficult, course, how difficult was it to convince the parents? It was really funny because um, Wash is like, my parents would not believe me, Rosalina. I've known him forever. He's one of those, you know, guy who is like, you know, always do some, you know, you know, like parents go, what the hell are you doing? But it was funny because in one of the episodes, I forgot one or two, he even told his cousin in the episode, he goes like, yeah, I met this, you know, I married my wife because when I met her, she's the first Vietnamese girl that I, you know, go out. I never date Vietnamese. And then I brought her home to meet my parents and my mom. After the first time meeting her, she said, if you marry her, I forgive you for all of the BS that you pulled in the episode. So it's pretty funny. Um, but um, but yeah, so I I believe it when he said that my parents are not gonna do this, is they're not gonna believe me. It's like, what kind of thing are you pulling right now? So anyway, so I I did go over there. I basically flew over, he flew me over and um What's more funny is he didn't tell him that I was coming. Oh shit! Wow. <laughs> wow. He he said that it was his daughter's birthday, Lincoln, and that they were having a party. And I flew in. I I stay at the St. Regis right around the corner. I went over. They had no idea why I was there. See what see what I'm oh saying? God, wow. And then, course like you know first time meeting his wife too never met his wife and so I you know I said I'm Rosalina I'm walking around the house I came over and she said no idea who I was and then I said this is Rosalina one of Washington's like really good friends she, of course she heard of me so she's like oh my god it's like and she's wondering what the hell I'm doing that yeah it's really fun so then it came out then I saw the parents and then we finally sat down and I told him, I said, you know what? I wanted to do this show, told Washington. He asked me to talk to the family, had a whole family discussion. Um, and I said, I will help you guys through this, you know, because um, they all know, I don't, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know, the, you know, the business or anything. I said, I, I will stay by you and I will just help you, you know, and anything you don't want to do, you don't have to do. Right. You know, we negotiate contract and all of that and i say good thing it's going to be the first vietnamese reality show ever this is like we're making history yeah right and that's one thing and i say i want to talk about our culture too you know vietnamese it's like we have grown so much we have done so much in the united states and we need to show that so they agreed parents what? gave what kind of question, what kind of questions that they have for you? I mean, they must have been like, "This can't be real," or, you know, "No, we're not into that kind of sort of showing our family, you know, on the inside." I mean, did they give any pushback to you? Of course. I mean, 
it wasn't quite pushed back, but it was like, basically they asked me questions like, um, so what do we have to say? You know, they never, you know, be in front of the camera before. How do we act? <laughs> I said, just be your normal self. You don't have to act, you know? Uh, it's reality, you know? So you're yeah. not actors, you just regular people. And of course they asked like, Leslie's working, she has a job, right? Day job to work at home, but still. They said, how long, you know, how long does it take, you know, and why should we do this? Um, and it all came down to, it was Washington. Washington really wanted to do this. He wanted to do this. I think it's a point of his life where he just wanted to do something different. And he, he said, it's my calling. This is it. This is like what I love. Wow. He, he, you've seen the show, right? Yes, I have. So The entire show, yeah. Oh, he's very good. I mean, he doesn't have to do anything. It's him. What you see, it's just him. It's his personality. And he's a natural. He's just funny in front of the camera. And um, he wanted to do this, something different. And we all knew that. Even parents knew that. The whole family, when it came down to, they agreed to do this because they wanted to do it for Washington. Mm. That's so lovely to hear it's it's heartwarming it's to hear that something for someone you love yeah give them a chance to really like you know it's sing. so it's it's really like yeah it was really neat it's not an easy thing and i i reminded them i said you don't want anything to be shown on tv don't say it i repeated that so many times and i said you know what you, no matter what you do, you got to come like, like, like realize that come down to reality. You know, you still a family, you still, you know, husband and wife or whatever. So whatever you do, on, you know, in front of the screen, you know, turn it off. <laughs> yeah. Be you know, mindful. and be, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The Parents totally like, mom, that they were totally nervous. I you know, especially, not... especially mom, she was very nervous. His wife and especially his sister, Judy, she's a natural. It's just she's, not part it's of both our beautiful. Culture. Yeah. It's just not part of our culture you know? to be on uh, recorded, you know, having your lives recorded like that. Yeah. But I, I was like, I wasn't surprised for some reason. Hmm. I told Leslie and Judy when we filmed the pilot, I said, you guys would do it just fine. They were nervous, you know, like the, when we filmed the pilot. And I said, don't. Just, you know, don't look at the camera and it just you do your normal thing. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not reading lines. We would, you know, so, but they, like I say, they were just really beautiful and they were just so natural in front of the camera. It's amazing. You know, <laughs> mom was the, mom was the only one that I, I sensed that was really nervous yeah. and but you know it's normal it's a reality how did you meet Washington oh my goodness <laughs> through another I was I get a call one day and this person just said Rosalina I have you know this friend that I want you to meet you guys would get along just fine because you you love like fine things. You love fine dining. You love great wine, you know, and all of that. And he's, you know, he's in Houston. He's belonged to the millionaire boy club or whatever. And he loves wine and he wants to come out to Napa. And I know that you know a lot about Napa and you have a lot of contact there and, you know it'd be great if you guys meet you know it'd be really fun for you guys to meet that's how I met Washington he came out to California and uh you know we host him to go to Napa and it's funny because after that we also host him when we went to the Hamptons <laughs> so we, we started doing a lot of fun things together he became like a little you know brother you know the little brother that now and then you know, you want to just like put in time out. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a good guy. 
Washington seems like a great guy. Yeah. He actually, uh, he and Reagan, um, we worked on a film together. I produced a movie, a hip hop film um, in 2010 in Vietnam. And I flew out to Houston to meet with uh, Reagan and Washington uh, through a great, a good friend of mine, Michael Din. And they put us all in touch and those guys put in money for the, for the movie. So um, they're great, you know, uh, believers in the in the arts and pushing the Vietnamese. Yeah, do you know what I'm saying now? So it, it's not a surprise that he wants to do do this, right? Yeah. And it's like fate almost, if you think about it, right? I'm to it have, is, right? I mean, how in the world is just so random? It's like, ask me that, you know? And it, the thing is, I wasn't the only one. There was another woman, uh, I think she's Chinese, and she knows a lot of people too. And she knows a lot of the, those same people that I know in San Francisco. And, you know, um, they, they, she got a lot of them to audition. And I didn't have a lot of people audition because I just don't think that it's the right people anyway. I think they auditioned at least like in the high 50s wow. family, you know, and wow. I just went in and I just turned the right family <laughs> So, so like one shot, one me. kill for you? Was this just one, one shot, one kill? Yep. No other family you approached. This was it. Nope. That is yep. crazy. Yeah, thinking about that. Oh, no, I didn't approach anyone. I guess I just don't see it. You know, I just don't see it. So I'm like, why bother? If it if it didn't work for the whole family, I would have just like, okay, I'm sorry, but. You know, I just didn't see anyone else that would fit that role. And they fit it perfectly. They fit that. The storyline, everything is so endearing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. tell everybody, uh, you know, who I talk about, House of Ho or Bling Empire, when people roll their eyes, I'm like, don't do that. Don't roll your eyes. Yeah. Keep an yeah. open mind. Keep an exactly. open mind. Exactly. Oh, you have to keep, like, major open mind, you know, yeah. um, so yeah, so basically, yeah, yeah it's yeah. It, these stories start. I believe somewhere. in faith. Can't I? Can't, I, I? I so believe in faith. I believe yes. in meant to be. Believe in karma. It's like all of that. I'm not superstitious. I don't. I don't believe in fortune teller. <laughs> right, right. But don't. If I'm some, you know, if I'm gonna die, I'll die. I don't need people to tell me like you're gonna die tomorrow. But I, I, I don't need people to tell me I'm gonna be rich. I know. No. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. I don't. But I, um, like I said, uh, like, m like my parents. You know, we, um, you know, we we are old school, but we also modern. You know, we do what we're supposed to do. I don't need to go tell, you know, look at a fortune teller to, to tell me what's going to happen or whatever. Right. Um, but I I believe like so much in like faith. You know, I'm a believer. You got to believe. Yes. You know, and you got to love what you do. Don't go find a job because, oh, that job's going to pay me, you know, $200,000 a year. Go find something that you absolutely love. The money will follow. Yeah, that's so true. Um, but it takes people a lifetime sometimes to end You up. have to have guts. You that's have have the thing. Guts. You have you to have, have, have guts. Have, yeah. Have to In have my guts. young days, I, you know, and I tell people, younger people still, I said, if you, you know, if you don't love your job, people that work and they go home and play every day, right? And I said, you don't love your job, walk away. Go find something else to do. Don't sit there and complain. Like when I walk away from my job to start my business, people thought I was crazy because there was nothing wrong with my job. I was making a lot of money, you know, but I just, this is like my calling. I knew it was right timing. And I was, you know, you know, younger. And I said, if I don't like this, I can always go back and do something else. You know, I mean, I have the skills, so yeah. why not? Do you think that um, the entertainment business for you is sort of the next track of your life? Like sort of the next, you know, decade of your life is going to be spent mo more now in entertainment? A lot. 
we Why? have a lot of projects now. Why is because, that? Because I have a lot of things going on. People like been approaching me, you know, to do projects and we have multiple projects. So my companies are, it's uh, Roseland Entertainment, my entertainment company, but a friend of mine introduced me to um, Scott, who is now my business partner. He is part of IDES, like the Isles of March yeah. um, Entertainment, based in LA and Singapore and Korea. Um, we met like right before COVID started and we kind of merge and we work together and we have a production and a distribution um, area, you know, with the company. We also have management, you know, talents. So since then, we have we built a really good portfolio for um, you know our company. We we bringing films from Southeast Asia to U.S. and um, we also get approached, you know, by writers and other people you know now i read a lot of scripts which i love and so we are doing um you know we're working on a few um movies we have uh, a couple of like tv shows that um we're working on as well um and i'm working with my friend matt on a few um, script as well, like our version of, you know, different things. So I know that all of these projects is like going to keep me very busy. Right, right. Have you, um, I mean, you've, it sounds like you've been back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. What when yes. was the first time you went back after you left? 2007. Oh, wow. That's fairly recent, huh? To like 13, 14 years ago. What, yes. what was that first time like for you? I never, when I, okay, before that, the reason it took me forever to go back, my brother and sister all went back before that. Uh, my mom and dad refused to go back. I mean, I right. think they're upset about the whole, you know, the fall and they don't feel the same. Um, me being the youngest one, like everybody, my whole family's, you know, here or Europe, um, I have no reason to go back. Um, my husband, who's, he's British born, and then my children are mixed, right? They always wanted to go back because they want, the kids want to know where, you know, I came from, the whole right. thing. And I say, well, it was a matter of time. And then it's funny, one year it was Chris, uh, it was uh, Christmas. Yeah, Christmas of uh, 2007. Us and another couple, like we, we were like, let's go to Hawaii, right? For Christmas. And we said, yeah, you know, let's go to Hawaii. But then our friends like, you know, why is not this couple? They always wanted to go to Vietnam. A lot of our friends want to go to Vietnam. They won't. They don't want to go unless right. I go. They kind of tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you know, it's kind of like almost, you know, halfway, Vietnam. Yeah. Like, you know, like, so I say, it is not. <laughs> but then they say, well, we have nothing to lose. Let's go to Vietnam. Kind of like spurred the moment. We did. We went to Vietnam after Hawaii. Oh, and after Hawaii. Yeah, we went to Hawaii and then Vietnam. Vietnam. They wow. Yeah. So I went there, it was four of us, and then it was really strange. Although I left so long ago, the minute I landed in Tung Sing Yuk, I remember everything. It felt it wasn't like home, but I yeah. felt familiar, familiar. And when, you know, the car from the hotel picked us up, you know, to go to district one, 
I start recognizing everything. It was so bizarre. I left when I was so young, but I start recognizing and I go, oh yeah, that's this street, this street. They all look at me like, oh, are you kidding me right now? The minute we down by, you know, Jabantan and then we going toward, um, you know, uh, our hotel that we were, st- we, were, we were staying at the Hyatt. Oh my God, I told them where everything's at, where the caravel's at, which is mm-hmm. my mom and dad used to take me as a little girl, go out there, you know, like to see clients. My dad have coffee, go to Bordard for ice cream. I mean, I start telling them all this and they were oh, freaking out. Back. It came back, yeah, it came back. And I I, I just remember, I my memories is like, I have really good memory, I guess, you know? A lot of people kind of like shut you know, shut like certain part of their life. I guess I I was not mad. A lot of people were mad, you know, like my parents were mad and all that. Lose everything. But I wasn't mad. I was just like, there's nobody there. My family is over here. Why am I going over there? But it wasn't like I was mad at, you know, like at anything. All came back. We, We spent like, I think, oh, like almost two weeks there. And we went everywhere, had a blast. You know, um, my husband, like everybody's like, let's adventure out, you know? And at the time I didn't have a lot of friends there yet. Right. So we just, um, we went Gucci, we went to Mekong, you know, got like one of those boats floating down the river, you know, I mean, just did everything like, it was just so much fun. But that at, some, was, at some point in your mind, did you think to yourself, I could be doing business here? I could be like working here? No, not at the time. I didn't. It was just more like for fun. I'm home. You know, and I get I went back to my family home as well. Like our family owned property in district one in Salo and you know, in all the different areas. And I took them there. It's freaking bizarre. I didn't go in, but you know, I, it, you know, we got on sick low. They still have at the time. And I go, let's go there. We went there and I said, that's my home. God. You know, it's like crazy. I remember exactly. And the name of the business, because we have business friends, still there, still there. The sign, and I, the signage is still there. Yeah, the sign is still there. And the, the, the people that were for my family, which is one of the, the lady kind of took care of my mom before I was born. To, she's still alive. She's like in her 90s, right? You saw her and, on that trip? And then I didn't see her in that trip, but then I came back the year, the following year. I did go see, my, my sister stay in touch with everyone, by the way. She's still, my sister's like the biggest heart. She still helped everyone wow. send money you know like just you know people are like live in district one but they can't afford you know they but that's one of the reason why my parents never sold the property because it's like people who work for us still live there and then their kids and the grandkids my my parents like if we sell the property where they go wait so, they still own the property yeah they still it's still yeah they still own the property your parents still have the paperwork for that property yeah we so hope it, my brother came later um, one of my brother and he brought like documents. Yeah. I mean, once you have those, you can't like, there's no arguing. You know, it does. Yeah. It's just really bizarre, but it's really neat. And then, um, yeah, so that was my first time. So I came home. Oh my God. And out of the blue, two months later, I got this phone call from one of my really big client from Orlando, but she was in Mexico. She called me. And she's like, Rosalina, I'm in Mexico. And I go, what do you do in Mexico? She's like, oh, I forgot. You just travel a lot. <laughs> but then she's actually, I'm here at the Miss Universe pageant. And the, the president of Miss Universe, Paula Sugar, she's with me. And she's in love with the, you know, with the necklace that you designed for me. And it was funny because that necklace, it was the necklace that I did, the signature necklace for Parker Posey in Superman Return. So, she, and we sell it through Neiman and she, like I customized one for her. So 
I, you know, Jacqueline, she said, Rosalina, they are looking for a new designer for the crown. Wow. Because Miki, Miki Moto has been, you know, using their crown for a long time. And, you know, Paula thinks that, you know, they need a new look. And she put me on the phone with Paula. We talked, you know, had a great conversation with her. And she's like, you know, do you ever come to New York? I say, I go to New York all the time. She's like, come see me, you know? And literally like a month later, I was, I had a trip to New York and I came to see Paula. We hit it off, instant friend. And she asked if I want to like, you know, sponsor the crown. And it's like sponsoring the crown, it's a lot of money, budget wise and everything, right? I wanted to do it, but I said, let me think about it. And I, you know, and Paula said, you know what? I know it's a lot of money, you know, no matter what, let's stay in touch. I want to work with you, you know, one way or the other. Right. And we left it at that. And then just like a month or so later, I was in Hawaii for vacation with my husband and my kids. We were in Maui at the Four Seasons at the pool. My phone rang and I usually don't answer because I'm on vacation, right? And I looked and I saw Paula's name. I answered the call and she said, hey, where are you? I say, I'm in Hawaii. And she said, um, I have, you know, something to propose to you. And I say, what? She said, well, guess what? Miss Universe this year is going to be in Vietnam. And I said, oh my God, that's amazing. And um, so I said, um, yeah. And so she's, and I said, so what can I do for you? She said, well, there's a company in Vietnam, uh, Cao, C-A-O, is a Jew, is a jewel, the jeweler. They are the sponsor for the crown this year. It's a one of a one of a kind crown that they want to sponsor since in Vietnam, they want to be you know, the, the sponsor for the crown. And I say, that's wonderful. And she said, but I can't approve any of their design. <laughs> so it no matter how much you pay, the you know, the pageant has, you know, they have to approve yeah, the design. I say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so th- Paul is like, I think this is an opportunity for me to work, for us to work together. Will you help me? And I say, well, I don't know how, but, you know, like, why don't we set up a call with the, the company? So she's like, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on a call, three-way call to the owner Hawaii. of the, yeah, like at the pool. <laughs> <laughs> with the you know with the with the owner of the the company and you know first thing she asked me she, you know I, I said I speak from problems and she asked me if you know like how are you you know I've heard about you you're very successful and all that you know how much would you charge for you know designing the crown and I said well first thing first let me see what I can do right and I, I, I told her, I said, I want to help you and I want to help Paula to make this happen. And then I said, send over what you have and tell me what, you know, what you want, you know, the design, you know, what you want to keep on the design, what is your idea of, you know, the crown. And so they have a designer who, you know, sketch the design. And so we hung up, right? And I, the time there was like faxing still happening. <laughs> so they faxed over the front desk, you know, a copy of it. Mm-hmm. I took the paper and I went upstairs to my room with pencil. I doodle and I w- just doodle. And I, you know, she wanted the crane to, st- you know, I just, she gave me all the, you know, what I would like to be. I doodle, but then like, an hour, I just play with it. And then I went downstairs and I faxed it back to them and I faxed it back to pa- to Paula. Paula called me and she said, this is it. Wow. Just like that. You know, and we didn't talk about the cut, the stones, any the color, you know, just the design. And I told her, I said, can I do this color stone? 
because, you know, I'm known for like my, all my pieces with a lot of colors right. and it'll be like a signature piece one year, one of time, you know, never anyone done the, the Mikimoto's pearl and then a lot of diamond. Right. And then I, I showed her, I said, coloring I said you know it's pale it's, past, it's kind of pastel like it's not going to be in your face you know so it was approved it was approved and then we had another call with the owner and then this time she's like okay I owed you big you know what you what would you like and I you know and I say you know what nothing I think I shocked everyone phone went quiet I didn't want payment I didn't want anything I said I was glad that I can help Paula wow you know, to make the business deal. And then I told the owner, I said, I, in one condition, you're, I know Vietnam too well. I know the Vietnamese, like her designer probably gonna get in trouble because she didn't do it, you know, like she didn't do, you know, the design to get approved. So I said to her, I said, why don't we do this? She, and she started it, I fixed it or whatever. I said, why don't we do a co-designer? So I want, I make sure that she got the credit to get it, get the credit and keep her job. So I base that's all I thought about. So she, we got co-designer title and then the crown, you know, was being made. Um, and Paula called me back and they thanked me. And I said, you know, no problem. Paula called me back the next day and she's like, Rosalind, you can't just do this. Like, you know, let me do something for you. And I say, yeah, I'll do anything. And she's like, well, you know, since the pageants in Vietnam, how would you like a trip with just like, come join us, you know, like our husband and the kids, come join us. And I, at this point, we were just there, right? And then my kids were like, this is somehow, this is faith. Mm. right because told them about the trip and they like we want to go and I you know I looked at my husband he's like heck yeah let's go you know yeah. this is like amazing it'll be fun yeah, plus the pageant yeah. yeah so you know to come do the pat so they booked us first class ticket to like you know everything to Nyatran for the you know but I told her I say if I go can I book my return different because I I, I, I want to spend more time so I can show the kids, you know, like from south to the north and everything. So I made it like a month something, you know, and that was no problem. And then, you know, I told, you know, a few of my really good friends and they go, we're coming. So I had a whole like entourage. entourage. <laughs> Everybody's like, see, finally, you're going to go. I'm going to go with you. Like, let's do it. Right. You got to show us Vietnam. We're going to go with someone who speak the language. And then that was like one thing. And then of course, like a few days later, a, a Paula called me again. And I'm like, yes, Paula. And she's like, well, since you're going and I have a favor to ask you. And I say, yes. And she's like, why don't you like be one of my judge? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so I said, she's like, I said, well, I don't know anything about pageantry you know i never judge anyone right and she goes it's, it's you do the preliminary so you, you get you know it's much easier and i said still like how do i know how what to judge and she's like you have great style yeah. you want to know what who to pick and so i kind of like chuckle at this time you know my husband's like i help you <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you would <laughs> <laughs> so we're crack up at this time and I say oh, why not right yeah. so you know a day later I got in you know FedEx package this thick of like folders of all the beauty queens pictures profile so when I got in the plane that was my homework wow you had to research all of them yeah it was really funny it was like everything was kind of like oh my god you know, and it was a blast. I, I got to meet a uh, bunch of like, you know, amazing people. Uh, one of them was, um, uh, he was, he's Lady Gaga's manager. And I don't know if you remember, Lady Gaga sang in Vietnam. Remember. Yes, that's how she got big. It was 
the, nobody noticed. Oh my God, this is so funny. And so many people, I tell people, she came, to, the, her manager booked her the gig, right? And she came and my kids were like younger, high school at the time, Brittany, she knows, she, I go, who's Gaga? And it's like, they go, oh yeah, she's, you know, the kids are up to date and all of that, right? She's, she's really like the new thing. She's great, you know, whatever, but nobody knows her. She performed like at the pageant, it was it hit worldwide when she got back here. She yeah. got huge. Wow. She blew up. That's how she blew up. Everybody knew who she was. After you that know, performance. Just, yes. Because I remember like that was one. And her manager and I, we're still friends. He moved to London now. It's not my manager anymore. But he's like, so he was one of the the judge, right? And then there's some like executive from like NBC, um, you know, just like really cool people. Like all of us judges like able to hang out and it was really fun because I'm the only Vietnamese. So, you know, during like off time, they like, let's go around, like tour around. And I was their tour guy, right, you know, we right. go and like, uh, you know, which is the market. And I said, I love Vietnamese like tropical fruit by the way so i can live on that when i'm in vietnam so i said let's go and eat like fruits right and so i make him try everything and of course so ring the durian you know that was like <laughs> thing that nobody like it was like what the hell is that it's funny like um one of the guy I, you know he's he, he likes to smell everything and i go do not smell mm. just eat and so when it turned the durian i didn't tell him what it was you know I took a bite, like out, you know, like I spoon it out the, the seed, and I said, "Just open your mouth," and I shove it in. His mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, this is really, you know, how Dorian, yeah. you don't. If you don't smell, smell it, it, you're gonna be okay. Yeah, just, I mean, it's like to people, it's like it's to us, it's like you like it. It has an amazing fragrance, but then to a lot of people, they say it smell like gasoline or dirty socks. Right. I'm exactly. like, how does that? it's well, weird know, it's weird because even vietnamese people there's 50 percent of the population that don't like it and 50 percent that'll you know that oh, really no, like it. A lot of vietnamese who will not eat it vietnamese who a do lot. not like it yeah it's a lot yeah it's a lot i mean my husband my mom used to bring it fresh from to my house all the time and he go what the hell's that yeah. and then you don't put it in your refrigerator and like for years he would not touch it right but then this is back then when we didn't have a lot of Vietnamese fruit import here. You go to Vancouver, you go up Seattle and you right. drive across, you know, go Vancouver and you get everything, right? So I used to crave these fruit and we just used to have like fun trips. We just fly up to Seattle and do road trip to Vancouver to eat it. And one year he tried it. He oh, loves it now. We go to Vietnam. He's like, where's the durian? He yep. eats durian. My daughter loves durian. You know, so every, you just, He's it's an inquired thing. Yeah. Yeah. Got a condition. And, cool. Yeah, but then that's how it happened with the whole Miss Universe. And we had an incredible trip. We went, we started in Saigon, you know, and went to Tron for the pageant, went to Hoi An, which became one of my favorite. We stay at the Nam Hai, which was the brand new hotel at the time. It, I met the developer there and we stay at one of their villa. It's still till today, it, Four season bought it. So you know how good that is. So one of my favorite, we we have like great memories there. Um, you know, the guy who was my butler, he was like the head butler for the hotel. We stayed in touch with him. He's a great guy, you know, gave him a lot of like, um, it was funny because he asked me about, he's, he's a young guy about like girl because he had somebody he wants, you know, to date and marry. He ended up married her mm -hmm. and he, you know, he, he sent me pictures. It's really cool. So anyway, um, just met a lot of amazing people through the whole adventure. We end up, of course, in Hanoi, right? And we, you know, we stayed at the Metropole with all of my friends, did cooking lesson, and did, it's so much fun stuff, to, you know, like the whole experience. Um, you know, the whole French colonial in Hanoi is amazing. And then we, uh, we, we chartered this amazing, beautiful boat in Halong Bay just for us. And right. we did like a three nights thing there. 
and um, it, it was just an incredible trip, you know, um, and that's, that's my adventure with the Miss Universe, and I guess I did okay, because I got asked to be back the following year to judge again in uh, the Bahamas. Wow. You- so two yeah. years in a row, Miss Venezuela won. <laughs> <laughs> two years in a row. So you you sound like you have a, a fantastic life and I'm wondering sort of I mean I'm hearing all of the sort of things that are coming out you know in your stories and it sounds like you are in the habit you make it a habit to really give back to the people that you make contact with like you're, you're very open with giving back to these people I do my parents my mom taught me that and I'm very grateful for that. Again, parents taught all of us, my whole family. And in Vietnam, my mom ran a lot. You know, she has multiple business like I do now. I got it from her. But she also did a lot of charity work. She used to, like, basically, you know, have show put together for the, so you know, for the soldier, like, the, you know, out, yeah. you know, and of nowhere and she would fly out there bringing them you know like products and you know um and she's part of the amerasian does this chair this um um you know um one of my mom's friends she ran like an orphanage for the amerasian because you know all the soldiers and everything she yeah. worked very well with them as well um one thing i never forget i get so many gifts like during Christmas I was like the baby I was like you know basically like I get so many gifts I was not allowed to open every single one of those gifts I was allowed three gifts everything else get donated to the orphanage so just growing up mm -hmm. I I love working with uh children charity I mean and then through my business but my jewelry i i support a lot of um other charity as well like through my clients all my clients you know they are you know the who's who and they also you know do a lot of you know charity work giving back when they support me in my business i support them back i mean to me that's just life yeah yeah you know i mean that's this happen because you support each other do you have projects in now in vietnam um sort of um to you know help build community or anything in vietnam it, something is happening right now that i'm kind of work with your friend Brittany. i can't quite say it yet but it is to build it's it's toward education so we are working on something um but i am working with uh the film industry over there i'm bringing films from vietnam to united states and actually distribution to all over the world so that's what i'm working right now and two of the films that i'm working on right now happens that we are we probably going to film over there so at one point I look forward to all of that stuff. That's uh, exciting news. Um, yeah. I I want to thank you um, for today. And I hope that we can have a conversation um, very soon again. Um, once your next project comes out, or if you have projects, I would love to talk more about them. And, um, you know, I know we had some limited time because you, you have to run today, but I want no, to, I'm sorry. No, yes. no, no. It's perfect. It was perfectly appropriate the time that we spent today. And I hope that this is sort of the start of um you coming back for for more um sit downs with me to talk about the work that you've been doing. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I want to learn more about you as well. Thank you, Rosalina. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. It was really fun chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.